Hey there, it's time for another Goulet q and I am Brian Goulet of GouletPens.com. This is the 44th one of these things that we got going on. I got a bunch of good questions this week. I got uh, 14 of them that I've picked out. So it should be pretty good. Not too many, not too few, just the right amount, I think. So it's an open forum this week. I'm just taking all kinds of questions, whatever you got. You know, I've kind of been digging the open forum for a while. I was doing kind of a brand-centric theme or maybe a topical theme, but I tend to get more questions, more variety and stuff with each open forum. So I kind of dig that. So I'm gonna keep that going for a little bit. Um, this week is no exception. So it's August 15th here, 2014. And on this week, uh, let's see, what have I been up to the last week? Well, it's pretty much like back to school season here at Goulet. You know, we sell a lot of notebooks and ink and pens and stuff like that, stuff that you might use if you were going back to school. So this is the time to get it, you know, early to mid-August. So we've been posting a lot of things, a lot of reviews related to back to school products. We've done our own. I just did my own video two days ago um, about, you know, excuse me, back to school shopping. So lots of all kinds of good information there for you. So if you are going back to school, now's the time to look because there's a lot of good information out there for you. Um, it was really interesting. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a big Gary Vaynerchuk fan and lately he has been doing these Q and A's, which he does them, you know, hashtag Gary V on, on Twitter. Um, and so he's been doing his own Q and A. I think he's done like seven or eight of them now. Um, and of course, you know, I've got 44 under my belt, but you know, I feel kind of proud about that. Anyway, <laughs> no, he's definitely got me beat in the video department by far. But anyway, he was a big inspiration for me. He's part of the reason why I started doing videos in the first place. So big shout out to Gary. Um, but uh, it was funny because in his Q&A, he actually had on there uh, a question from somebody about cake or pie. And for those of you loyal uh, viewers here, you know that cake or pie is something that's been up for debate here around the Goulet shop for quite a while. And I've gotten asked that on Q&A before. And I am, a, I am a cake man all the way. Like, I love pie, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of different types of pie that I love, some I'm not so crazy about, but I will pretty much never take pie over cake. You know, it's just cake, I just love it. You know, I could go, go on about it forever. However, Gary V is all about pie. So I was sad to hear about that. I don't have a cake man, but then, <clears throat> you know, we decided we did a, we did a company lunch today. And so we uh, had some new folks we wanted to introduce. So we um, went ahead and did a, um, another cake or pie, kind of an update. Cause we did one, you know, around this time last year and it was pretty split. Uh, but we've had a lot of new folks come on board and we hadn't done an official kind of tally. And I gotta say, man, pie obliterated cake. There were like seven of us that were into cake and everybody else was pie. It was just not even close. It's really sad to hear that. We even had some people that were previously cake that flipped to the dark side and became pie. Like, come on. Anyway. It's kind of a silly thing, but I thought it was awesome that Gary V did that. And I posted a comment on the YouTube, you know, channel there about, you know, the pie thing. And he responded, so that was cool. So um, anyway, um, been up to some new stuff. Margaret and Anna, they're two of our new customer care folks. They um, started last week, but we just got their bios and pictures up on our website. So go to the About Us page, meet our team, and you can read a little bit about Margaret and Anna. Really excited about them. They're picking up on things really quickly. They've been watching tons of videos, been doing all kinds of training, product training with them. You know, they're helping now to process orders and they're doing lots of handwritten notes. It's really great. They're getting fully like integrated into the team. They're gonna be awesome. Um, and then we've also got Madigan who's starting next Monday. Um, she's joining our customer care team too. So we're really trying to beef things up. If you notice, you've got live chat that's on a lot more now. So we're really trying to just put the right people in place to be able to do all those awesome service things here at Goulet that we've always been trying to do. But as we've gotten busier, you know, staffing properly is always um, a challenge. So we're definitely getting into the right place now and excited about everybody that's coming on board. Um, product wise, we have just a couple of quick updates. We haven't done anything monumental recently, but um, the Twisby Mini did come out in a white with rose gold. That actually looks pretty nice, kind of a neat little thing. So you can go and check that out. We think we've still got some of them left. Normally our products are pretty, or our quantities are pretty limited with Twisby stuff, but we've got some, some half decent quantities of these ones. So we've still got them in stock after a few days, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Um, and then we've also got some new Deatramentis um, document inks that are gonna be coming soon. I think we got four or five of those that are coming. I know there's been a lot of buzz about those on FPN. They're not easy to get here in the States. So we're bringing them in. We're still in the process of getting them color corrected and everything and swabbed and put up on our site. Sarah, our photographer, actually broke her elbow. So she's not able to do nearly as much as she normally would because she hurt her working arm. So we're trying to be, give her a lot of grace and just be really patient with her, letting her go see it to her doctor's appointments and stuff like that. And she's just, you know, not able to work as quickly because she's got a heal. So, um, 
you know, what are you going to do? So that's kind of what's been up to us lately. So um, got a bunch of good questions here um, from, you know, a lot of Facebook and, and whatnot. So I'll go ahead and uh, get into those after I take a swig of water because <coughs> I'm doing a lot of talking today. So my voice is a little worn down. First question from Jenny L on Facebook. How does the rose gold nib compare to a gold and a steel nib? Or is there no difference and it's all purely for aesthetics? That's a great question. Um, how do you know? You know, for that matter, what about titanium? What about, you know, um, ruthenium and stuff like that? Um, most of those are just different coatings. Rhodium, you know, same kind of thing. Those are just metal coatings that are over top of either a steel or a gold base nib. Now, sometimes you might have a titanium, like I know Stipula's got this titanium, like T-Flex nib, and Visconti might have some, you know, some different uh, materials, palladium and titanium, stuff like that. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about, you know, you're asking specifically about rose gold. Um, there's a couple of pens recently that have come out, um, you know, like Twisby 580's got a rose gold, the Mini just came out with rose gold, the Platinum Nice has rose gold trim and whatnot. Um, but these are just the same normal nibs that would be on the other versions of the pens, but they're plated in this rose gold just for the color, for the aesthetic of it. So the rose goldness necessarily won't really change much other than the aesthetic appeal of the pen. Now, this leads me into a question from Mary B on Facebook. The second question of the day, Mary B has been a relentless asking me about the difference between the Twisby 580 rose gold and the Platinum Nice. And I know you were asking about, you know, writing samples and doing ink and paper and stuff like that. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to have time in the Q&A here today to actually do up a full writing sample review kind of thing. That's something I've had intentions of actually doing in a whole separate video, but I just have not had the time for a variety of reasons. And I apologize for that. I really do. But I can at least go ahead and hit some of the highlights for you. I thought it would be something key. So let me try and actually zoom in a little bit. I haven't done this in a while zoom in and show you a little more what's going on with these pens. Um, so what I have here, this is one on top. This is the Platinum Nice. Okay, so it's the Platinum 3776 Century Model pen that is in this clear um, finish that has kind of this um, frosty look to it. So it's got flutes that are cut into the pen, and these are physical flutes. This isn't just a, um, an aesthetic thing. Is it kind of weird, the fact you can't really see my eyes? Sorry. <laughs> um, but anyway, so you've got this pen here, and um, it's got the slip and seal cap on it, so it's got a really, really good seal on the insert of the cap. So this pen basically won't dry out for the foreseeable future. You know, they, they, they stay up to two years without drying out, which is pretty righteous. Um, so you can actually, because it's clear, you can actually see that kind of slip and seal thing working in there. I don't know how close you, you can see that there. But basically, when you start turning the pen, it'll hit the insert, and then you go about another quarter to a half a turn, and it's actually kind of locking that thing down. It's got a spring mechanism up in the cap. Um, this is the same kind of slip and seal mechanism that's on the Bourgogne, the Chartres Blue, and the Black Century as well. So it's um, really neat to kind of actually see how that works. Um, this is what Platinum came out with. They're kind of taking a little bit of a break from the Lakes uh, limited editions. You know, they got five different lakes around Mount Fuji that they are um, in the process of coming out with special editions. So this one they did, it's not really a lake, you know, it's, it's Platinum Nice. So it's based off of, you know, the sandy beaches of Nice, France. So that's where this kind of frosty thing comes from. Um, the one of the most notable things, aside from the aesthetics of the pen, is the texture is a little bit different. Some people really dig it, some people don't like it so much. It's really, it's, it's hard, I can't really describe it to you all that well, but other than it's um, because of this frosty kind of feel, it's not as smooth and glassy as kind of this, this Twisby is, and as some of the other Platinum 3776s are. So it's a, it's a very light pen though, very light. You know, it's much lighter than the 580. So it's, especially if you don't have the cap, this pen is, is really, really light. So um, that's really kind of neat. Um, so uh, you may be digging that, but it's a $200 pen, you know, and for the first um, 2,000 of them that are sold, they're going to be uh, engraving numbers on them. So I've got number 145 here out of 2,000. So that's kind of cool. So um, once the 2,000 sells, then they'll just go to a regular, um, a regular number, or they won't be doing numbering anymore. They'll just be, you know, selling them. Um, the Twisby 580 Rose Gold, so the 580 is a piston filling pen as opposed to the cartridge converter of the Platinum. Um, it's the same 580 that you would normally get except it's got that rose, rose gold trim and it's got a black grip cap and um, you know, uh, piston knob here. 
Um, and then the trim is the rose gold. Um, it's a little bit more expensive than the other 580s. This pen is $70, so $70, $200. You're gonna have to determine whether that's right for you. Um, I will say the nibs are pretty stiff on here, but then again, the nib on the Platinum is pretty stiff as well. 580's got a steel nib, the Nice has a gold nib, but it's a really stiff gold nib with a decent amount of feedback. So the two nibs actually don't feel drastically different from each other, except that the finer nibs on this Platinum are gonna be ground a lot finer than the Twisby ones. Twisby is using German nibs on here. Platinum makes their own in Japan. The Japanese tend to grind their nibs a little finer, especially on the, the uh, extra fine and fine sizes. So I know that doesn't give you way too much information there, uh, Mary, but it's something better than I've been doing for you so far. There we go, oh, wait, no. okay, there we go, got it. So at least that's a little something for you to go off of. Honestly, is it gonna, it's gonna boil down to, do you wanna pay $200 or do you wanna pay $70? Um, you know, you get more ink capacity with the Twisby and it's a shinier looking pen. It's gonna be a little bit heavier, um, but it is, you know, it's something you can take apart yourself. It's kind of fun to tweak and, and, and do that kind of thing. Um, I have had a little bit, I mean, I'll be completely honest, I've had a few more issues with flow on the 580 rose gold that I have on the regular 580. I don't know if it has to do with the, the rose gold plating or something as opposed to the, you know, the stain, just the plain stainless steel versions of their regular ones. Um, Twisby's got a pretty good, you know, warranty policy and stuff, so I wouldn't worry too much about that, but, you know, it, it, I have heard people saying that they are writing drier, and we've seen that ourselves too, and the, the feedback has been that's kind of how they are. So that's something to take into consideration. The Platinum is not an extremely gushing pen, um, but their re re reputation is really solid. And you know, the Platinum the 3776 is such an underrated pen. I know I haven't really talked about it as much. I've been talking about it a little bit more recently, but it's a really solid pen. So even though it's a lot more expensive, it's still a really nice pen. You know, you can get the other 3776s for around $176 as opposed to the 200 of the Nice. So, you know, it's really up to you whether which one you find is more appealing. So hopefully that helps you out, Mary. Um, <clears throat> next question from Ravina J on Facebook. Just wondering if after the DC Pen Show, if Goulet Pens is any closer to carrying right notepads in company. Um, it doesn't really have anything to do with DC um, because I didn't even see them at DC or talk to them or anything. Um, perhaps they were there, but DC is kind of a big event. and. Rachel and I only spent about, uh, you know, we spent Saturday afternoon and I spent part of Sunday morning there. We weren't working it, we didn't have a booth or anything, so we didn't do quite as much mingling and hobnobbing as perhaps we could have, but, um, you know, honestly, I, I didn't even think about right notepads while I was at DC. Um, we've reached out to them in the past, though, and funny enough, they told us that their paper was not really ideal for fountain pens. Um, but they're, they're looking to possibly change that in the future. I don't really know much about that. Um, but from people that I've heard that have used them, they said that it actually holds up pretty well. So it was interesting. That's normally the other way around. <laughs> we hear that, oh yeah, fountain pen friendly paper, sure, but then we try it and we're like, yeah, this is not so hot. Um, but, you know, I haven't actually tried this stuff for myself. Um, they were, you know, maybe I'll have them send us some samples or something and, or we'll, we'll buy some and just see how they work. But uh, it's kind of up in the air right now. So. Um, we'll have to see about that one. But if you've got any experience with write notepads, um, love to hear more about it in the comments. Jeff A on Facebook, Brian, do you know of any way to prevent the Noodler's Nib Creeper Rollerball from burping ink onto the page randomly? Um, well, it's not random. Everything is a reason, especially when it comes to fountain pens. It's just a matter of whether we understand what that reason is or not. So. A um, couple of things could be going on, okay? So the way that that pen fills in particular is it's got that feed with the rollerball tip in there. And that feed kind of sits inside that larger grip of the pen. And if you look at that grip, it's got a large indentation that's all around that feed. Well, when you're filling that thing, that around there is where the pen is actually filling from. It's not filling from the very, very tip. That's where it flows out of, but it fills from where the feed is fitting into that grip of the pen. Well, what happens is when you fill it, that whole thing is filled with ink and you need to take like a paper towel or you know, napkin or whatever it is that you're using to wipe off your pen after you fill it. You need to take and kind of dab that like up in there around the feed because there's a lot of excess ink that it'll pull out of there. So that could be part of it is just that ink that's dripping out a little bit. Maybe, maybe that's part of the issue, maybe not, I don't know. But I'm more than willing to bet what's, ha bet what's happening is you're actually getting some um, 
some air that's inside your ink chamber that's heating up due to the heat in your hands and then causing ink to burp out of the pen. That's almost always what happens when you have a decent amount of volume of ink inside a pen is you get um, essentially what it is a pressure change. Okay, so what's happening is that, pets, that pen in particular, the walls of the pen are somewhat thin and they are plastic and when you are holding the pen in your hand, the heat from your hand after a period of time is going to heat up the pen. It happens. And when you have a large chamber that has some ink and some air inside the pen, the air is going to heat up with the heat from your hand. It's going to increase the pressure. And the only way that it can release that pressure is, guess where? through the feed, okay? And if you've got the pen in writing position, that air is heating up inside the ink chamber and it is going to force ink to burp out of the pen somewhat randomly because what happens is it's going to burp and then your pressure is released and then you're okay. And then you're gonna hold the pen for a little while longer, it's gonna heat up again and it's gonna burp again at some point. This could also be a factor in the environment that you're writing in. If you're writing outside on a hot day versus writing inside an air conditioned area, that's gonna make a difference too. So that could be part of the randomness as well. But I'm more than willing to bet that's what's actually happening. And it's probably burping from around that feed area that I just mentioned where the pen is filling from, not actually out of the, the tip of that pen. That's almost always what happens. It's not exclusive to that particular pen. I just think because of the way that pen's constructed that it is going to happen more often just depending on how you're holding the pen. So not really a lot you can do about it except for trying to get the air out of that ink chamber. So if you get the ink, if you're using it and the ink level is getting a little bit lower, you can turn the pen upside down, take that piston and push it up a little bit and expel some of the extra air out of the feed so that you have just ink left in that ink chamber. Flip it back over, keep on writing, you should be good to go. That, that will do it. Or what you can do is you can just keep the pen uh, at a fuller ink volume and then you won't have as much air in there too. As long as you don't have a lot of air sitting in there, you should be okay. All right, Sean K on Facebook. What do you think of the very high priced fountain pens? Are they worth the money or are you really just paying for the name? What's the best way to approach significant purchases like that? And what should we look for or avoid? Well, it's gonna depend, you know, it's really gonna depend. Whether, you know, especially when you're talking about high priced fountain pens, there are people out there, you know, a lot of people actually, who they first get into fountain pens, they think paying $30 for a Lamy Safari is a high priced pen. You know, they've never paid more than, you know, 50 cents for a pen in their life. And just the concept of paying that much money for one pen blows their mind. And then when you say like, well, why don't you go shopping for some of these other pens that are like $500 or $1,000, that's like absurd to them. You know what I mean? And I totally get that, I, I really do. Once you're really kind of like into fountain pens and it's like really kind of your thing, then $30 starts to seem like a kind of an inexpensive pen. It doesn't really seem so crazy. You know, spending $100, $200, sure, seems totally reasonable. You know, then you get $500,000, you're like, okay, that's pretty expensive. What, what really am I buying with that? So I'm gonna kind of assume here that the range of prices that you're talking about. I'm gonna talk about pens that are kind of $250 or more, okay? That's kind of the assumption that I'm saying is, you know, a high priced fountain pen because that's the point where you really start to get away from just the pure functionality of the pen and you start to get into some of the um, less tangible aspects of the price of the pen, such as maybe where they're manufactured, um, maybe the material that's used to make the body of the pen, this, the rareness and stuff like that. If you're getting into limited editions and collectibles and stuff, there could be a lot of factors like the design aspects, the artistry, the, you know, if it's got any kind of a trademark or anything, you know, think about like, you know, um, I think it's uh, Montegrappa has done a bunch of different pens. Like they did a, like a Bruce Lee pen. I'm sure there's like trademarks involved with doing that kind of thing. Or, you know, I've seen other companies that might do like a Yankees pen or a Dracula pen or just like other things like that. They might drive the price way up just because of their affiliations with whatever organization that they're doing or whatever trademark kind of thing. Also, you've got other things like if you get some of these special edition pens or really expensive pens might have really fancy cases, you know, really solid wood cases and stuff that can, that can be part of the price that don't have anything to do with the pen itself, but more the presentation of it. Um, then of course you've got brand name is always a factor. You know, you get into these pens, you get to be more status pieces, and then you're getting more into kind of the fashion aspect, the status aspect of these things, as opposed to the actual function of the pen itself. 
um, that right there immediately will change the price by a, quite a significant degree sometimes um, just by the name like you're saying so it really depends on what is your approach you know there's definitely when it comes to the function of a pen there's a law of diminishing returns right so if you're looking at a four dollar pen the difference in quality that you can get between a four dollar pen and a thirty dollar pen is pretty significant right and maybe a fifty dollar pen you can get some pretty good bang for your buck for that price range going from a fifty dollar pen to a hundred dollar pen well, it's not going to be quite as significant, not as drastic of an increase of features and quality and stuff like that. Then going from a $100 pen to a $300 pen, maybe there's no difference in quality at all. It depends on who the manufacturer is and what else is going on with it. Um, there could be a host of factors. It all, you see, this all kind of depends. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know, the, the kind of crossover point you get with most fountain pens in terms of their pricing is when it goes from a steel nib to a gold nib. The cost of gold is very expensive. It requires more training and stuff. It's less machining, more handwork that's often used to tune those nibs. So right there, that's going to increase the cost, all those factors right there. So you'll see kind of a jump, you know. You really won't see any gold nib pens um, for until you get to around $140, okay, for most pens. And then from there, you really got to be a special pen to have a steel nib that's kind of pushing $150, $200. You got to have something cool going on. Um, but then, you know, once you get up into that kind of $200 plus range, well, then you really kind of start expecting gold nibs. You know what I mean? So that right there is kind of a crossover point as far as, you know, higher price fountain pens. You know, and is gold nib really better than steel? Well, it depends, you know, for some people, sure. But for other people, they may never know the difference. It's kind of like if you got a nice fancy, you know, set of golf clubs or something. If you don't know how to do anything but slice, it doesn't matter what golf clubs you use, you know what I mean? So it really just depends on the individual and how well tuned you are to how nice of a product you're actually using, whether or not it'll actually make a difference. So if you want to actually get the most bang for your buck, I would say, you know, maybe look to avoid some of the higher end brands that are focusing more on status, more on their marketing, you know, the ones who are maybe getting into other goods like watches and leather goods and things like that. They are obviously have more of a bent on becoming an all around kind of fashion um, you know, company as opposed to purely focusing on the utility of the pen necessarily. I'm making some assumptions here, of course, but you know, that's just kind of my observation of what I see goes on in the industry. Um, so stick to, you know, the actual function, the features of the pen. You know, there's definitely just going with certain materials over other ones. You know, if you want an ebonite pen or a celluloid or something like that, you're going to pay more just because that material is more rare, it's harder to work with and so on than you would for, you know, a simpler, you know, resin, plastic, whatever, or even certain metal pens. It could be uh, much less expensive. Um, and then look for comparable pens that are similar in the price range. Compare some of the features. See if, you know, that pen is actually a good value for what you're looking for in that range. It's pretty easy to tell, especially on most online retailer sites, you can kind of search for pens within certain price ranges and you can see what kind of features you're getting for around that price. See if you're getting something that's pretty good. And then the last thing is to like read reviews of them, you know, either people's blogs or checking out um, retailers reviews, you know, goodlaypens.com or whoever else, you know, whoever's got reviews out there. A lot of times people will talk about what it's like to actually own them and that can help you out quite a, quite a bit. All right, next, Edgar H on Facebook. Can you, can you suggest some nice fountain pens between $50 to $100 with a stub nib option? Yeah, um, so basically in that price range, you're not gonna get anything with a gold nib. You're gonna be sticking all with steel, which is fine, honestly. Um, there's nothing wrong with steel nibs. I've used all kinds of steel nibs and I love them, you know? Um, so in that price range, what I have most to recommend is going to be Lamy, Monteverde, and Twisby, because those seem to be kind of in that sweet spot there. So Lamy, um, the all-star, which is not quite in the $50 range, but, you know, with a converter and everything, it kind of gets up there. So they've got a 1.1, 1.5, and 1.9 millimeter um, stub option. Um, it's the same nib that you're going to get on the Studio and on, you know, the CP1 and the logo and stuff like that. All those pens are kind of in that price range. And that nib, pretty solid stub nib. You know, it's nothing magical, uh, but it's, you know, they're solid performers and I, I enjoy them quite a bit, especially that 1.1. That tends to be the best one, I think. Um, but yeah, that Studio one too, I really like. I like the Studio pens because they're a little bit heavier. They've got a sleek design to them. They don't look quite as student-like, I guess, as like the Safari or maybe even the All-Star is. But I do like the All-Star too, you know. Uh, Mata Verde's got a bunch of pens in that price range. The Impressa, the Intima, the Jewelria, the Prima, 
the Invincia, the Regatta, you know, they've got all, they really like to and start with I's and end with A's in that company, don't they? So they got a bunch of nibs in there, and those are all the exact same nibs that are used on all those pens. Same nib, same feed setup. So um, it's going to be a similar writing experience with all those pens. Monteverde's nibs tend to be the tines tend to be pretty tight on there. So I find that it helps if you just kind of take the pen, this is not a Monteverde, this is a Twisby, but if you kind of take the pen and just press a little bit to spread those tines ever so slightly on the page, just to kind of bend them and loosen them up a little bit. You know, don't overdo it, be careful, but um, uh, they definitely are a little tight. So if you are familiar at all with the um, process of increasing ink flow, you can definitely help a little bit to kind of spread those tines. Um, another thing you can do is you can actually take your fingernail and just kind of put your fingernail right above where the feed is um, and just push on the nibs, push the tines away a little bit evenly amongst the two tines away from the feed and that can help to increase your flow a little bit as well. That helps out a lot, I find, especially with those Monteverdes. Um, and then the other one would be Twisby. You know, Twisby, the 580, the Mini, the Classic, the VAC 700, all of those pens have stub nib options. Um, oftentimes just a 1.1, some of the pens have a 1.5 nib option as well. 1.1 is definitely more popular um, than the 1.5, but um, all of those will get the job done in that price range that you're looking for. <clears throat> Carlos Q on Facebook. Hello, Brian, do you have a top three mini or portable pens? I have the Pilot Prera, the Twisby Mini, and the Coeco Sport eyedropper. I love them all. So I was wondering if you or somebody in your workshop have a top three mini or portable fountain pen. Um, well, I haven't done a video on the top three mini pens, but um, you know, I think you've given me a good starting point here. Uh, the Pilot Prera, the Mini, and the Coeco Sport, those are all great pens. Excuse me. I don't know that I would necessarily consider the Prera to be a mini pen, but it certainly is a smaller pen, so it would certainly fit in there. Um, any of those three that you have, I would recommend to anyone for, for decent, you know, portable pocket pens or whatever. Um, another good one is the Monteverde Paquito. That thing is a little sucker, you know what I mean? And it only takes cartridges, so that's the one kind of bummer thing about it. Um, but if you're using, it's standard international cartridges, so, you know, it's doable. You can refill them with an ink syringe. You know, it's not the end of the world, but that's a really kind of a cool one. Um, you can't convert it to an eyedropper because it's a metal body, but um, that one is really, really tiny, and, and it works really well. Um, another one is a Pilot Stargazer. That's a much more expensive pen. You know, you're paying like Pilot Vanishing Point prices there, but it's, uh, it's a really nice pen. I like it. It's a smaller pen. I've done a quick look on the, the Stargazers. You can check that out. Um, and then another one is a Pilot Vanishing Point. You know, it's a, okay, so it's not necessarily a pocket pen, but it's a little smaller. You know, it's, it's, it's a little stubbier than some other pens. And because it's a click pen, it's really convenient as a pocket pen, you know, or a purse pen or whatever, because you can just pull it out, click it, write with it, click it back, and good to go. So that one I would definitely have in contention as well. Um, but uh, if you're in kind of more in the budget range, the Paquito is, is an awesome pen. I would recommend you check that out. All right, Flavio A on Facebook. Can you recommend nice looking clear demonstrators that can be converted to eyedropper filling? I don't understand why manufacturers make beautiful demonstrators such as the Monteverde Artista Crystal or the Platinum Cool, both of which even have translucent feeds that are not meant to be converted. I know, this is one thing that just, you know, breaks my heart whenever I see a new pen and the thing looks beautiful and then I open it up and it has this like large body, this large cavity with no holes in it and then I look and it's got a metal grip, you know, or the, the back end where the, you know, nib feed sits on there is metal and I'm like, dang it, everybody's going to ask me if this can convert to an eyedropper and I, since I can't say yes because it's got that metal in there. You know, technically, yeah, you could do it. You could convert either of those pens for a short period of time and it wouldn't be the worst thing. But the problem is if you have ink soaking on metal parts of the pen for a long period of time, it's eventually gonna corrode that metal and it's not going to be good for anybody. So it's kind of unfortunate, but yeah, those pens, there's definitely um, got some issues. And I looked, you know, I had to actually go look at my site and like how many clear eyedropperable pens do I even have? And it's not that many, honestly. Um, everything else is not going to be convertible either because it's not clear by your definition here, or it does. It has a metal part on the, especially where the, like the the body threads onto the grip. The back end of the grip is going to be um, metal most often. Um, the Coeco Sport is one that it's plastic and you can convert it. The other one is the Noodler's Ahab. So you take that, um, it's not a converter, it's the piston, but you can unscrew the piston off of that pen. You can convert the whole body to six milliliters of ink. It's a huge amount. But it's, uh, those are the only two pens that I have. It's, 
it's kind of amazing that that's that's it. That's a clear demonstrator and eyedropper convertible. But that would be it. Rick B on Facebook. What's the darkest, as in monolithic, non-reflective, light-canceling black ink you've ever seen? I like Noodler's X Feather, but was wondering if you've discovered anything better. Uh, X Feather is great, very solid black, good choice there. Noodler's Black, Heart of Darkness, Borealis Black, all of those Noodler's Blacks are pretty darn black. Um, and then Aurora Black as well. That one is kind of known for being super, super dark black. Those are kind of some of the blackest ones that I know of. If you've got some other opinions, I would love to hear about it in the comments. Um, how black something truly is is going to depend a lot on the kind of paper you're using and the type of nib that you're using as well. The wetter it is, the darker black it's going to be. That's definitely a factor. And usually, if you're using a more ink resistant paper, it's going to seem darker because the ink is going to pool up more and it's not going to spread out as wide as it would on an absorbent paper, which can cause the dye to look more diffused and not as dark. All right, Richard B. on Facebook says, the reformulated J.R. Brown 1670 Rouge Hematite really have the gold flakes removed. Speaking of which, do you have an idea of when you'll get the new 1670 Stormy Gray? Okay, you got two different, you're talking about two different inks here, so I'm gonna stick to Rouge Hematite first. That's the red one with the gold sheen. Um, no, it does not have the gold flakes removed. So it's, it's interesting. Okay, so this ink has had a bit of a saga, right? So originally when it came out, it was supposed to be just for that one year, which would have been four years ago, four years ago now at this point, I think? Maybe it was, yeah, four years ago. So it came out four years ago. It was supposed to be just for that year, you know, with the anniversary ink of the 1670, and then that was it. But we only got like one or two shipments in, and everybody was in an uproar like, is this really all that's ever gonna be here? And, on and so on, and so they kept on making it into the following year, and then it was kinda like, well now it's not really an anniversary ink anymore if they keep on making it new and all that. And, but eventually they said, you know what, it's just a really popular ink, we're just gonna keep it. Um, then they came out with Blue Ocean, which was another 1670 ink, so now it's become kind of like a series, right? Um, not necessarily just an anniversary ink, but it was, you know, an homage, I guess, to the 1670. So that's the year that J. Bond started, by the way. Um, so um, originally they came out with the color, um, had a really good, solid gold sheen, like really heavy, really popular, but had some flow issues sometimes. It crusts up on the nib and so on, um, and some people complained. So they stuck a sticker on the back of the box saying, oh my gosh, this thing's gonna explode if you even look at it. You know, the, it doesn't really say that, but the language is so much harsher than it really needs to be. The, the ink, it crusts up on the nib, sure, and it can dry out and stuff like that, but you know, you just have to clean it out every now and then, you know, maybe a little more often than you would a normal fountain pen ink. But it's, it's not like it like seriously clogs up and ruins your pen or anything like that. In fact, it cleans out actually rather easily. So they changed it and they said, you know what, this is just too much hassle. We're going to remove a lot of the gold and just make it kind of, you know, more plain, more of just a red and take away, they didn't take away all the sheen, but they took away a lot of it. And that was the version two. Um, and by the way, we didn't get like any heads up when this happened too. They just made the change and it came through. So it was kind of like, what, they changed it? You know, we didn't know. Um, so I don't know exactly when that happened, but I would say about two years ago they made that change. Um, and then recently, you know, everybody was saying, oh, we want the gold back. Where's the gold? Why isn't gold here? You know, so they were like, okay, you want it easier to clean. So now it's easier to clean, but you know, there's no gold sheens and now nobody's want, you know, people don't want it. So they ended up changing it back, not to the original formula with that intense of a gold sheen, but now it's kind of somewhere in between. So it still has a gold sheen, but it does not uh, have the same, you know, issues that it had the first go around. So they're claiming that it's a lot less troublesome than the original, um, but it has more gold sheen than the second version. So we're on version three now, and we'll see how it goes. But, um, you know, the one thing I do want to point out about is that the paper that you're using can really change a lot uh, the feel of that, that, or not the feel, the look of that ink, right? So if you have a really absorbent paper I've found, then it just, um, you know, has, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. I had an email that popped up here and caught my attention. Um, so if you are using that ink and it's on a really absorbent paper, it tends to knock that sheen right out of there. I don't know why, but then if you're using a very ink resistant paper, the sheen pops right out of there. So um, that might be one thing for you to experiment with if you wanna get the most out of that ink. Um, and they made that change to version three um, a month or two ago. So it wasn't all that long ago. It was like midsummer of 2014 here. So now everything moving forward should be the new stuff. 
But of course, it's kind of confusing because some retailers may have old stock. Everything on GooleyPens.com now has been the new stuff since they announced it. It was coming, but um, it's, uh, you know, some other folks may have some of that old stuff sitting on the shelf. Who knows? All right. Angus D. in an email said, Why don't Goulet Pens and other U.S.-based retailers from whom I purchase pens fill out the warranty card that some manufacturers, Pilot, Platinum, etc., include with the pen? Obviously, you're an authorized retailer. Yes, we are. I don't know who else you're buying from. I would assume that some of them are, but maybe not. Who knows? It never hurts to ask. Um, obviously, you're an authorized retailer, and I understand that the pen doesn't have any less of a warranty simply because the card is empty. That's correct. I was just wondering why they even include the cards if it isn't required for after sales service. Contrast with this with my experience shopping at a pen shop in Seoul, Korea over the summer where they diligently filled out the card for each pen I bought. Are these cards used in other markets but not the US for some reason? And would it be too time consuming for the cards to be filled out? Um, I mean, it's not necessarily this too time consuming. I think, at least from, the pers from my perspective, I think the cards are more for brick and mortar retailers, not so much for online ones. I'm thinking if you're a brick and mortar store and somebody comes off the street, buys a pen, pays for it in cash, you have no idea who they are. They can say that they bought the pen from you, but there's really no way to follow that up. Versus an online retailer where everything is getting tracked, you have to, you know, you create an account or at least have some kind of record for the purchase that you've made. If ever there's a warranty issue, then there is at least a point of contact that you have, a, you know, some kind of paper trail over where that pen was purchased. They know it came through an authorized dealer, therefore they can follow up with the warranty. I think that's the reason why it's not a big deal, and um, probably the reason why some of them include the cards. You know, you specifically called out Pilot and Platinum. It's interesting. We actually um, hosted. We had. Um, um, so a couple of uh, folks from Japan in Platinum come here uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that was that was uh, really an honor. Actually, the president of Platinum was here. So that was really, really, a, and it's such an honor for us. Um, but it was so interesting just talking about the cultures that are different. You know, I've never been to Japan. Um, I know obviously the culture is very different than the U.S. But uh, over there, he was just talking about how you know in Tokyo, it's like every single street corner has a pen shop on it, a physical brick and mortar pen shop. You know, and here in the U.S., it's like there's like none, basically. You know, so a an online retailer like us becomes kind of your main source for purchasing fountain pen supplies, right? So um, it's different because over there, you know, ev everybody's brick and mortar. You know, so you're going to have kind of that warranty card kind of mentality, even from the manufacturer. So they're going to be shipping out the pens with warranty cards, thinking. Well, of course you're going to fill out a warranty card. That's how it's done. But being in the U.S., it's like no, that's really not how it's done. You know, we have an online record of everything, so that warranty card, I mean, doesn't really isn't as necessary. And you know, most pen, actually, most manufacturers don't even include a warranty card of any kind. And if they do, it's not anything that needs to be signed or filled out. It might just be like, hey, here's a card that says that you have a warranty on your pen. Congratulations. You know, it's not anything that we have to like fill out or sign or anything. So, um, actually, the whole warranty card thing is actually actually kind of like I'm not as familiar with that process because it, it's never really been um, anything that I've had to do in the five years that we've been selling um, you know our fountain pen stuff online um, and nor has it ever really been communicated to me even as an authorized retailer that that's something that I need to be doing for my customers so nor have I had any of my customers even asking me to fill them out. So it's really, it seems like kind of formality or maybe just something the way business used to be done and isn't as much anymore, or just maybe isn't as relevant in my own personal kind of business here. So, um, and you know, you mentioned being in Seoul, Korea. So um, it could also be a cultural thing too. So think about like Pilot in Japan, you know, they're making pens, but they're being distributed throughout the world, right? So it's not just Japan and the US, you're talking about everywhere. You're talking about Korea, you're talking about, you know, Europe, you're talking about all these different places, South, South America. So the culture of the way that things are distributed, the way things are marketed, all that stuff is going to be different in different parts of the world. So uh, here in the U.S., things might be done very differently than they are done in Asia or in Europe. So in, in Asia, it may be like everybody fills out warranty cards. That's just how it's done. There's not even a question. Uh, but you know, in Europe or the U.S., it might be, no, it's not a big deal. We don't even think about that. You know, so it might be more of a cultural thing as well. A lot of it depends on the local distributor that you're dealing with, um, which is sometimes based on the continent, but often even individual countries will have their own distributors that will market and distribute things throughout that country uh, based on what they feel is going to be the best way to do that. So lots of different factors going on here, as you can tell. Chad, see you on Facebook. 
I recently, I recently purchased a new nib from Goulet for my Twisby 580. I noticed that it was writing very scratchy, and upon inspecting the tines, discovered the tines were misaligned. I'm sorry about that, Chad. Instead of contacting Team Goulet or Twisby about the issue like I should have, I grabbed a pair of needle nose pliers, oh, and very, very gently was able to realign the tines, and now the nib works like a dream. Even though my repair issue was minor, I found that I enjoyed tweaking my own nibs, not like it sounds. <laughs> Can you recommend or know where I might be able to find basic but proper tools for adjusting nibs? Thank you. Okay, Chad, first things first, please don't use pliers on your nibs. You don't wanna use pliers because you're going to ruin, if you didn't ruin this nib, you're gonna ruin the next one. I'm telling you, don't put tools on those nibs. Um, you might think that that's what needs to be done, but often, especially if you're just talking about nib tine alignment and stuff like that, you can do everything you need to with your fingers, man. You got all the tools you need right here, okay? Um, this is actually kind of relevant because um, Drew and I, we just went up to the DC show last weekend. We attended Richard Binder's nib smoothing workshop. Um, uh, for the smoothing and like reshaping aspect of those nibs, um, we definitely needed you know some abrasives. You know, we used a 2000 grit sandpaper and micro mesh and mylar. Um, but for all of the nib alignment and stuff like that, man, it was all fingernails. No special tools whatsoever, no pliers, none of that kind of stuff. There are some tools that you need for like um, disassembling like certain older like vintage pens and stuff. Most modern stuff, you don't need special tools even. A lot of things are friction fit and stuff like that. You don't necessarily need all these special tools like you might be thinking that you do. Um, so I've got a couple of good videos. If you check out the Goulet Micro Mesh video and the Goulet Mylar video, I talk about nib smoothing there. But if you check out the, my Goulet Loop video, that's the one where I really talk about how to align tines and there I'm just using my fingernails on there. So um, Richard Bender's website, I imagine would be a pretty, pretty good resource too. I haven't actually found a specific part that talks about everything he talked about in the nib smoothing workshop, but he's a good proponent about, about nib tuning and stuff. So his, his site might be a good, uh, richardspens.com. Um, go check that out. So uh, yeah, that's what I would say. Don't go looking for special tools, but if you can't do it with your fingers, then it probably isn't something that should be done, okay? Couple more questions. Jennifer B on Facebook. I'm thinking of buying my son a Pelicano Jr. for his eighth birthday. Well, that's cool. Is he younger than the target age? He's a lefty, so I'd also like to know about quick drying inks that are ideal for self paws. Okay, um, his eighth birthday, you know, it's, he's probably about the right age. Yeah, I would say eight, nine years old, that's probably about the right age. You know, you think about you know, when you were in school, it was probably around third grade or so that you would learn to write cursive. So that's about the right age, I think, to start introducing it. You know, granted, if you're really familiar with fountain pens and you can really teach them right, um, you know, being eight years old probably is right about the right time. You know, you're not to gauge it by, by the kid, each, each kid, obviously, whether they're ready for it or not. Um, and you'll want to, you know, supervise closely and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, there's no reason. Pelicano Jr., that's actually a really solid pen. I really like the way that pen writes. It's got one of the smoothest nibs out there, actually. It's kind of, it's a great pen to start them out on. Um, it's pretty durable, too, so you can beat that thing up a little bit. Um, I think that's a great pen. You know, go for it. Um, you know, maybe get some cartridges, too. You know, the whole cleaning out the pen and all maintaining it and all that kind of stuff is really a lot for a kid at that age to have to deal with. Um, so if you do that for him, that would help out a lot, or just teach him how to swap out cartridges. I'm normally not a big cartridge proponent, uh, except when it comes to kids. It tends to be a lot easier in that respect. Um, and then let's see here, um, quick drying inks. Okay, so um, I would just get him on the pens first. I wouldn't necessarily move to buying a new ink yet. Um, you know, if you've got some pens, just let them try out some of the ones you have that you know are, are appropriate, of course. Um, but if you do want some quick drying inks, I would say, um, you know, there's not a ton of them out there that are actually formulated for fast drying for lefties. Um, the new there's Bernanke inks, so Bernanke in blue, Bernanke black, um, those ones are good. And then there's the um, Private Reserve has a few fast dry. I think they've got six different fast dry colors. Um, there's some other inks out there that will dry fast enough um, for that purpose, but um, uh, those would be the ones that I would recommend to the most. Um, but I would just try to stay away from like permanent inks and stuff like that. Stick with the, some of the more conventional inks, uh, at least while, you're, while your son's getting started. All right, and then the last question I'm gonna do for this week, Andre A on Facebook said, I caught a tiny glimpse of your pen collection in the video about pen storage. Any chance you can show us your full blown collection? I'll send you a cheeseburger, I promise. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you would send me a cheeseburger. It probably wouldn't be very fresh. Uh, and I'm pretty good. I'm not eating a lot of cheeseburgers these days. You know, I gotta, I gotta keep my, my physique here. So you know, maybe send me a salad instead. That would be good. But uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, gosh, yeah, I have a lot of pens. I really do. Um, and 
I don't really notice how many I have until I try to put them all in one place. So I guess I can crack open Pandora's box just a little bit here, not because the cheese were going to motivate me, but um, because I've recently kind of rearranged some things. Um, Alex here actually helped me quite a bit. She helped me rearrange some stuff. Um, so my office is cleaner now than it's been in a really long time. So I usually got a traveler's notebook that I keep a pen on. Pilot Metropolitan is a pretty good pen for that. Um, got an Aston 10 pen case here. I took the I took this to the DC Pen Show. It was more filled up with pens. So I got a couple ones on here. 3776, Lamy 2000, Pilot Custom 823. And I got a Bexley, actually. That was a gift from somebody, Piston Phil. So that was pretty sweet. Um, you know, I've got some, uh, you know, the, the Twisby and the uh, Platinum Nice. The Nice is actually uh, kind of on loan. That's why I'm not inking it up. Um, I got a Waterman Kareen here that I'm testing out. Um, interested in possibly carrying it, but not quite yet. So whenever I have pens that we're looking to carry here in the store, I'll usually pick one up for myself and just kind of test it out and see if I like it. Um, done that with some other ones. I got a couple of Aurora pens, Aurora Ypsilons that I've uh, been playing around with a little bit. Um, another Metropolitan here. These are all just pens that I have in my laptop case. Um, then I got a Pilot Custom 74, my blue with my medium nib, which I love, of course. Um, I've got all kinds of pens that I have, like just miscellaneous pens, ones that I'm testing out. Got a couple of like Faber Castell pens here. You know, a couple of Waterman pens. Like I think one of this is the case for the Kareen here. You know, so I've got a few of those. Um, and then I've got some other ones, like got a couple of vintage here. I've got some like Schaefer vintage Targas. Um, I've got a Conklin Herringbone, uh, Invincia Ink Ball. I got the um, Pilot's Custom, or Pilot's uh, Vanishing Point from last year, the uh, wood one, the special edition there. Oh uh, boy, I got a pen case here with all kinds of stuff. This is my um, Lamy case. Um, so I've got some interesting pens in here. These are all um, all stars. Lots of them are um, you know limited edition things that are not available anymore. I've got a Lamy Lady, a Persona, 2000. I got some Studios up here. You know they got the coffee and the white and royal red and blue and some of those. I like these 36 Monteverdi pen cases because I um, can uh, put a lot of pens in there. All kinds of other pens happening here. Um, you can see I've got a lot of them. I've got my little Twisby section over here. Pencil, here's my little Paquito that I was talking about earlier. So there's that one. I can't tell you every single pen I have because it would just take forever. This one here, I got my um, Safari collection over here. I used to have all my Lamy's in one case and then I got too many of them. So now I'm kind of splitting them up into two. I haven't really filled out that side of the case yet, but I'm sure I will before too long. Oh boy, I got a 20 pen case over here. I've got some of the Parkers, um, got some other random ones, some tool pens, and I got some Monteverde stuff. I really need to rearrange some of these things, try and put some of the brands together. Um, but uh, gosh, you're probably just like going crazy right now. You'll just have to watch this section over and over again. Then I've got another one. Gosh, I really have a problem, don't I? Got a Stipula Da Vinci, M800. I got some really nicer pens in here. Stipula T-Flex, um, Pilot Fermo, Vanishing Point, Falcon, Sailor 1911, Delta Fusion 82, Schaefer Prelude. I got a Mont Blanc 149. Yes, I actually have one of those now. I've talked about it for a while and finally sprung for one. It was actually a gift, I'm not joking. But uh, this one uh, is all my Edisons. So I got a whole case full of Edisons, all kinds of limited editions. You know, we got the Stealth Beaumont over here. I've got the um, Macassar Ebonite, the original one that I did and the remake that we made. Um, I've got, you know, a couple of the um, uh, premier special editions that we've done there. Oh boy, it just kind of keeps going, doesn't it? I've got uh, you know, some Japanese ones here. These are a lot of Platinums. Um, I got a Falcon in here too, but I got a Platinum President, the Bourgogna in there. Um, got some other random pens, got some Pilot Parallels here. And then I got some pen rolls. So I've got, this one is like filled with Noodler's Ebonites and Acrylics. Any, uh, any of those I can get my hands on. I usually hang on to them <laughs> first. Um, let's see here. These ones are some other ones. I've got some like the old school Noodler's Ebonite pens in here that are not made anymore. Like an old version of the Pelican Pelicano and just like some other random stuff like that filling up this one. Um, what is in this pen roll? Um, this one's just like preppies and plumixes. I got a couple Tatches in here, some older stuff. I got like a purple Pelican. Oh, hey, Pelicano Jr. There you go. Um, I was just talking about that a second ago. I got that in there. I've got a Jerobon Crea pen. 
Uh, you know, just interesting things like that in here that we used to carry back in the day. Um, some Noodler's nib creepers. I've actually got a couple of bins full of Noodler's pens, probably another 50 or 100 of those. I'm not joking. Ooh, yeah, my case, so my Monteverde Nighthawk, the original, original one here in the case. That pen is now discontinued. And last but not least, I might have missed a couple, but I got, um, let's see here, the pink and the black marble Pilot Vanishing Point limited editions that I have kept in the cases. So, I don't know exactly how many pens that is, but it's probably way too many. As you can tell, I am definitely a dealer hooked on my own product. I think I might have a problem here, people. I might have a pen problem. So, you know, for those of you out there who think you have too many pens, chances are you don't. This is too many pens. But believe it or not, I know people that have a lot more pens than I have. And this isn't even getting into like vintage stuff. This is all fairly new. But a lot of this is because I'm a retailer, because I can get my hands on these things. You know, I can buy them at wholesale price, so that does not help my pen addiction. Um, but honestly, most of the time, it's because I want to have these pens on hand, especially if it's like a limited edition, past edition kind of thing. I want to keep it for posterity's sake. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that I use them in video reviews and for pictures and stuff like that. So I want to have them on hand and not be dependent on when things are in stock on the shelf to be able to photograph it or whatever. So I like to have them so that I can play with them myself, increase my own knowledge and understanding so I can shoot better videos. That's a lot of the reason why my collection is so extensive. But that said, that's what I tell my wife. And <laughs> oh, honey, it's a really good uh, business investment here. You know, it can be really good. So, um, but yes, I definitely have a lot invested in these pens. Um, these are actually, these are, all, these are all, you know, they belong to the business. So these are really like the business's pens. I just consider myself lucky to get to use them all. So, um, you know, they're essentially marketing for marketing purposes and so on. But, uh, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough to be surrounded by fantastic pens all day long. So you're probably drooling like crazy, but there's a look more or less at my entire collection. It may vary here and there a little bit, depending on what's coming in and what's going out, but that's about it. So that seems like a good a place as any to end the Q&A. So if you have any questions for me um, for next week, I'm just going to do another open forum, just kind of keep the open forum thing going. Um, Next week is going to be, what, what day is that? The 22nd. Okay, so um, I'll be here. That'll be the 45th episode. Um, you can leave me a comment on YouTube or on Inc. Nouveau. You can hashtag GouletQA on Twitter. Shoot me an email at GouletQA at GouletPens.com. Or you can post on Facebook when we ask you the question early next week. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much for watching this video, for continuing to stay engaged with me. And I'm going to leave you with a question because, you know, Gary Vee inspired me a little bit with his last Q&A where he actually asked a question to the viewers. So my question to you is to be to post in the comments, tell me what's the first fountain pen that you've ever used. And if you haven't used one yet, what is the first fountain pen that you plan on using? I would love to hear your story. So. Um, my first fountain pen that I ever used was actually one that I made myself. Um, I, you know, had never used fountain pens before. I was making pens back in the day, making rollerball pens. And um, the way that I made the pens, you could swap out the grip section. Instead of a rollerball, you could use a fountain pen. So it was one of those pens. So it was actually uh, kind of a just no-name, like, kit brand pen that I turned myself. That was the first fountain pen that I ever used. But I think the first brand name fountain pen that I ever used. I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it was either a Platinum Preppy or a Pelican Pelicano, or no, sorry, Pelican Script. It was one of those two. I bought them very near the same time. I can't remember exactly which of those was the first one that I used, but I bought them at the same time. So uh, that's my story. So I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Please engage with me in the comments. I love to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much and right on. <laughs>